Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. I always love coming back to Armenia. It's, my, it's where I was born. Um, I'm going to be talking about the surgical management of rectal cancers and specifically focusing on organ preservation. And I apologize, I just added a few slides that I had removed because it will answer some of the questions that were already asked. So my talk might go a little longer than the 20 minutes that we were allotted. So I, I have no disclosures. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about my background. Um, I was uh, surgical oncology trained, uh, but I was lucky enough to train under uh, two very prominent uh, colorectal surgeons, Dr. Julio Garcia Aguilar and Dr. Alicio Pagazzi, both of whom are in New York now. And so my training uh, had a very specific uh, colorectal focus. Um, I moved to Baylor College of Medicine where I was uh, faculty for about 10 years and I was the chief of colorectal surgery there and then moved back to LA uh, to join a, a private enterprise and then eventually started my own uh, private practice. Um, so uh, we have a private practice surgical oncology team now with, uh, with basically three surgeons, all of them outstanding surgeons, all of them um, academically trained, academically minded, which is why we're called the Academic Surgical Associates. I'm, uh, I focus on um, colorectal and gastric surgery. Uh, my partners, uh, Dr. Alemi and Dr. Sizers, Dr. Sizer are uh, hepatopancreatic biliary surgeons, although all of us overlap. Uh, Alemi is the liver guy, I call Sizer the uh, pancreas person, but it's important when you're doing complex surgery, particularly when we talk about metastatic colorectal cancers, not only to have a multidisciplinary group of medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists, but to also have a very good multidisciplinary group of uh, surgeons, which is what, what we have now. So uh, we've talked about colon cancer of, uh, or colorectal cancer, a very common cancer. Um, about a quarter uh, to a third of colorectal cancers are rectal cancers. And briefly, the anatomy of the colon and rectum, um, depending on the definition you use, uh, the rectum is the last 15 centimeters of the um, large intestine measured from the anal verge and measured, what I mean by measured is measured by the surgeon with a um, rigid proctoscope. Um, uh, a little bit more detail on the anatomy of the uh, rectum. So again, uh, the definition of the rectum that I use, uh, 15 centimeters from the anal verge, measured by the surgeon um, with a rigid proctoscope and the, the location is the distal extent, not the middle, like we use in gastric cancers, not the upper, but the distal extent. We divide the rectum into three locations, upper, middle, and rect uh, lower, upper being 10 to 15, mid-rectal 5 to 10, and distal rectum uh, below 5 centimeters, and of course, there is an anal canal there. So the anatomic anal canal extends from the anal verge to the dentate line, which is about 1.5 to 2 centimeters away from the verge. Um, but the more clinically relevant anal canal is the surgical anal canal, which goes to the top of the puborectalis, so which is at around 3 to 4 centimeters. Other, other definitions that uh, I would say primarily the Europeans use, but as a useful definition, is the MRI sigmoid takeoff which roughly corresponds to about uh, 12 centimeters from the anal verge. Um, the rectum is surrounded by a mesorectum, uh, which is encapsulated by this mesorectal fascia, which we, we've discussed already. Um, but the more important anatomic margin uh, or anatomic landmark is the anterior peritoneal reflection, which is at around 10 centimeters uh, in males and around nine centimeters in females. And the anterior peritoneal reflection is the point at which a tumor goes from, or not a tumor, but the rectum goes from being um, intraperitoneal to extraperitoneal. Um, so this is an important landmark because you can essentially treat the two type of locations and the two type of tumors as different diseases. And uh, Yelena referred to that um, uh, briefly in her talk. So the workup for rectal cancer, again briefly, rigid proctoscopy by the surgeon uh, to uh, examine the distal extent of the lesion, local regional staging with EUS or MRI, both of them have their advantages and disadvantages, and we molecularly test uh, essentially everybody. Um, so before we talk about 
new things, novel things. I want to talk about where the current treatment uh, stands. So where are we now? Um, stage dependent, so with stage one disease, um, the standard of care is upfront resection. We can locally excise uh, well-selected patients, so what that means is low-risk T1 and 0, especially extraperitoneal tumors, local excision is appropriate. And selected T2 and 0 patients can go on the ACOSOC Z6041 regimen, which is preoperative uh, long course chemo radiation followed by local excision. Uh, for stage 2 and 3 disease, preoperative chemo radiation a la the German rectal cancer trial is still the standard of care, uh, followed by resection, adjuvant chemo. Uh, other permutations, so we've kind of talked about this for. Uh, uh, low-risk tumors, uh, preoperative chemotherapy with selective chemoradiation and PROSPECT uh, is the, is the uh, trial, but also mercury, uh, if you know the mercury data, also sort of plays a part in this. Uh, other permutations include uh, total neoadjuvant therapy a la OPRA and PRODIGE and other permutations including RAPIDO and, and so on. For metastatic disease, the current standard of care is um, Usually palliative treatment in incurable cases, but as we'll discuss um, later, there are um, opportunities to cure these patients as well, and generally cure involves both systemic therapy and surgery. Um, so I actually added these slides now because we, we discussed it uh, in our questions. So what is the appropriate oncologic resection for rectal cancer? It's to uh, perform an adequate segmental resection. So you have to remove the tumor but you also have to perform an adequate uh, or an appropriate lymphadenectomy, which for a rectal cancer is not so much a D3 lymphadenectomy, but it's a complete, or uh, let me put it this way, a tumor-specific mesorectal excision with a complete mesorectal uh, rectal fascia propria. So what does that mean for upper rectal tumors? You need to get at least five centimeters distal to the tumor because you can have tumor deposits distal in the mesorectum. Once you get to the middle to, to low rectum, then you're essentially taking the entire mesorectum anyway, and the only margin you care about is a negative intraluminal margin. And again, uh, an intact fascia propria, which looks like this shiny. This is a very old one where it was done open. I never, I never do these cases open anymore, but uh, a shiny mesorectal fascia. So we're going to talk about uh, sphincter and organ preservation. and mostly organ preservation. Sphincter preservation is already kind of the goal and already sort of the norm for the last 30 years. Um, and I want to say that we will not be discussing um, DMMR patients because these patients are treated now completely differently. And I, I kind of, this, this trial, which er, basically every patient called me about after it was published, um, I want to point out um, that it only applies to 5% of rectal cancers. And it was kind of um, inappropriate for the lay media in the US to publicize this so much without mentioning that this trial only applies to basically a very small part of rectal cancers or a very small proportion. So we won't be talking about these cancers, mostly PMMR patients. Um, so when you treat rectal cancer, um, you have to understand the goals, because there are competing goals. Um, so you have two sets of goals. One of them, obviously, are oncologic goals, local control, cure, long-term survival. And for this set of goals, the most aggressive surgery is the best. We can cure, or we can, you know, we can take out everybody's rectum, we can give everybody a colostomy, and we can give them the best chance for cure. However, we have functional goals as well. So what, is, what are the functional goals? Preservation of GI continuity with acceptable bowel function, preservation of sexual and urinary function, quality of life, and oftentimes the least aggressive surgery and the least aggressive treatment is best for function. So it's, these are questions or goals that are difficult to reconcile, and this is why patient decision making plays a huge role in, in, in how you treat these patients. So you have to have a relationship with the patient in order to give them the most appropriate care for them, not so much uh, for you. Um, uh, so what is a non-sphincter preserving operation is basically remove the entire rectum with the sphincters and give them a colostomy. We used to say a rough guideline, less than 30%. Uh, this is 10, 15 years ago. 
I almost never do APRs anymore, once or twice a year. Um, what is a sphincter preserving operation? It's basically a low anterior resection. You preserve the sphincters, make an anastomosis, plus minus a pouch, plus minus a diverting ileostomy. And there are approaches that have helped facilitate um, sphincter preservation, whether it's robotics, TATME, transanal, trans, or sorry, transabdominal, transanal approaches, um, other approaches such as intersphincteric resections and uh, interoperative margin assessment, which, makes, which helps us assure that the margins are clear before we anastomose. Um, that's all I'm going to say for sphincter preservation. It should be the goal uh, for now. Um, the more aggressive or the more um, ambitious goal, I would say, for rectal cancer treatment is, uh, from the surgery standpoint, is organ preservation. And when you look at the data, um, there are two, I don't even want to say competing, but there are two different approaches to organ preservation. There are approaches which utilize local excision, and this is uh, what I call the gray car two approach, and there are approaches that um, use watch and wait, uh, where you essentially follow a patient, you do no surgery at all, and I call this the OPRA approach. And when you go from academic, one academic institution to another, I would say there is a tendency to favor one approach versus the other, where probably the best approach would be to combine these approaches. So why do we care about organ preservation? Uh, well, even when we do sphincter preservation, and we're happy as surgeons that we've preserved the sphincter, done a very low anastomosis, and you know, GI continuity is intact, these patients have issues. Uh, a major portion of them will have um, low anterior resection syndrome with all its consequences, urinary retention, sexual dysfunction, and these issues are worse when you combine radiation with a low rectal anastomosis. So your goal as a, as a physician treating rectal cancer, I would say, is to try to eliminate one or the other, meaning either eliminate radiation or eliminate a, a surgery that involves a low rectal anastomosis. And there are strategies to do this. So briefly about the surgical portion of local excision, this is the full thickness uh, excision down to the uh, mesorectum and down to the mesorectal fascia propria. Um, uh, and as far as feasibility, you can do it for cases up to 9 centimeters anteriorly, up to 15 centimeters anteriorly. If you go higher, you're going to end up in the uh, peritoneum. And uh, we have done cases, I have done cases, where we have uh, what's called planned peritoneal entry, where you know you're going to get into the peritoneum, but you have to be prepared to fix it or divert the patient. Um, there are multiple approaches to surgical, to local excision, TAMIS, TEMS, TES, TM. They're all the same thing, basically with slightly different technology. And local excision tends to be oncologically successful, and this is what you have to remember, oncologically successful only in patients who do not have residual nodal disease, and it's hard to predict who these patients are. So the degree to which this approach is successful is based on how well you can predict who has nodal disease, who doesn't have nodal disease. And the benefits are obvious. You avoid, they still have some local low anterior resection syndrome, but much, much less than uh, a, a, a TME or a low anterior resection. A more aggressive uh, uh, organ preservation approach is watch and wait, as we said. And what is the rationale for uh, watch and wait after conventional chemoradiation um, and after specifically uh, chemoradiation with consolidation chemotherapy? We have very high. Uh, pathologic, not just clinical, but pathologic complete response rates. And so it makes sense to identify these patients and try to minimize surgery in these patients. Um, so um, I want to present the data uh, for organ preservation um, that informs my practice, and I want to go stage by stage. So I'm going to go, I'm going to start with the data for local excision approaches and then present the data for uh, watch and wait, and then we'll kind of go over uh, kind of the menu of options that I present to my patients uh, with respect to uh, overall multi multimodality treatment. 
Um, so uh, for data for local excision for stage one patients, for low risk T1 and zero patients, there's a ton of data out there that local excision is safe, including some of our data from uh, City of Hope when I was there. Um, so it's accepted for T2 and zero patient, and zero patients, the, the data that I use, um, or the, the most compelling data is from the Z6041 trial, partly from City of Hope when uh, Garcia Aguilar was there and partly from Memorial Sloan Kettering. But basically giving these patients long course chemo radiation followed by local excision um, with some crossover for high risk cases, you can achieve an organ preservation rate of about 90% um, with uh, low local recurrence rates. So I wanna talk about two additional local excision trials, which again, really inform my practice, and the trials are the CART study from the Netherlands and the GREATCAR study, which published recently from uh, France, at least the, the long-term data published recently. But the CART study uh, was uh, essentially a prospective phase two trial. They took uh, stage, two, uh, stage one and two patients, node negative, um, long course chemo radiation, and the 51 eligible, of the 51 eligible patients, 47 underwent local excision. 17 of those patients by criteria were offered TME, anything greater than YPT1, and we can debate whether this is necessary or not. Interestingly, more than half of those patients refused TME. Eight of them had TME, and all of them had no residual disease. So theoretically, if you observe this population of patients, again, it's hard to do, but theoretically, if you observe these population of patients, you could have achieved organ preservation as well. When you look at their long-term data, um, four out of those nine patients, and you kind of have to make it out, uh, uh, recurred, but they were all local recurrences that underwent TME, and it's unclear how many of them actually had nodal disease. But in general, historically speaking, uh, after TNT, not so much after long course chemo radiation, but after TNT with consolidation chemo, the incidence of nodal recurrence or residual nodal disease is less than 10%, probably less around closer to five to 7%. So these patients are pre potentially preservable. The other data set that I use for local excision is uh, something that's more um, applicable to my practice is the GRACAR2 trial. And the reason it's important is because it also included clinical N1 patients. So they took T2 to three, N0 and N1, so stage three patients as well, long course chemo radiation of the 80% of, of the patients who had a good clinical response by their criteria, they were randomized to either local excision, so organ preservation, versus TME. And again, uh, they had crossover for high risk disease, which was greater than YPT1, which we can argue about, but in the crossover patients who got TME, and these were the high-risk patients, only 7% had nodal disease. Again, which tells you that if you were to watch these patients, only about 5% of them would, or 7, 5 to 7% would recur in the nodes. And these are the high-risk patients. If you take the whole group, probably less. Overall organ preservation rate with the crossover was 65%, could have been higher without the crossover. Hard to do again, in a, especially in a trial setting. Uh, lastly, the Haber Gamma data, which I'm not going to discuss too much, but basically shocked the entire rectal cancer world in the early 2000s. They basically took patients who had had complete, a clinical complete response by, their, uh, by using an aggressive definition for a complete clinical response. And basically their five-year disease-free survival rate was 92%, which is shocking, meaning overall survival 100% and only 8% of their patients recurred. And more, their more recent data and, and obviously more contemporary data from the U.S. also is, uh, has a less rosy picture, meaning local, rec uh, local response, uh, recurrence rates are more along the lines of 30%, most of them salvageable. And the last watch and wait trial, so those were the two watch and waits. I went from local excision to watch and wait. Uh, there are a few other watch and wait trials, but the one that really informs my practice is, uh, like I said, is the OPRA uh, trial, uh, where, and we've talked about it already, so I won't, I won't beat it to death, but we took, they took very low rectal cancers. Actually, the average rectal cancer um, in their study was around five centimeters from the verge. Um, they uh, uh, randomized them to a consolidation, uh, basically both groups got total neoadjuvant therapy, either with upfront chemo radiation or induction chemotherapy and followed by chemoradiation, restaged, 
they say plus minus bi or this is plus minus biopsy, but actually they did not biopsy, and I think one of the cases brings this up. No clinical response. They went on to TME, and clinical responders went on to uh, a watch and wait uh, approach. Um, and in their protocol, any tumor regrowth mandated TME. All right. Um, the main outcome was disease-free survival. Um, I'm not going to go over their uh, consensus um, um, uh, criteria for response, but what they basically showed and what uh, Dr. Yip talked about was that although the two approaches of TNT had the same disease-free survival, um, there was less tumor regrowth and higher organ pre preservation in the consolidation chemotherapy arm, meaning if you give chemoradiotherapy up front, you have a much higher uh, rate of organ preservation, 59% uh, or so. Um, when you look at this slide, which actually uh, I don't think is published, um, but when you look at their complete clinical responders versus their near complete responders, the organ preservation rate in the near complete responders was actually not, not low, but quite low. And the problem was 50% of their TME patients ended up getting APRs. So not only did they not achieve organ preservation, but they did not achieve sphincter preservation. And again, uh, this doesn't mean they didn't do a good job. They were very low tumors, which, which up front probably had a risk of APR of, of about 50%. So I, I use OPRA a lot, but I, I, I recognize the sort of the missed opportunities in OPRA. And what did I mean by that? Uh, again, it's not in my place to criticize the trial. It's uh, a landmark trial. But what I identify uh, as the missed opportunities in OPRA are they did not include biopsy with sigmoidoscopy, which I re routinely do. And why is it important? Because if you identify residual disease early, um, regrowth can be identified sooner. And even in their own data, if you identify regrowth early, the sphincter preservation rate is higher. Um, also, if you identify regrowth, uh, the potential for regrowth early, you can potentially uh, salvage these patients with local excision, and this would be essentially using the gray card data uh, in combination with the OPRA approach. What is the other uh, uh, missed opportunity? It's not so much a missed opportunity because it was a watch and wait trial, but uh, OPRA did not include local excision and why is local excision potentially beneficial is because if you locally excise patients up front, even the complete clinical responders who had a 22% regrowth rate, you can potentially avoid regrowth and potentially still have organ preservation, understanding that your nodal positivity rate or your nodal recurrence rate is going to be around 5 to 7%. So you can easily preserve the rectum and surveil however you want to surveil for nodal recurrence. And the concern that, you know, I've, I've, I've discussed this with the OPRA investigators, and the concern is that after local excision, TME or sphincter preservation might be harder. And, you know, what I say is, well, you already have a 50% APR rate. You know, there is the potential for saving some of those patients, so it, it, local excision is potentially beneficial. The problem is local excision tends to be is a, technical, a technically difficult operation to do, and to do it well. Um, and the other concern is uh, local excision can provide um, uh, some degree of LARS as well. So the uh, two other studies, which I'm, uh, studies that I'm not going to mention, which inform my practice, is the Mercury study, which identified a good risk patient, a risk, uh, a good risk set of patients who, in whom you can avoid radiation altogether. So I used the Mercury study and the PROSPECT trial, which we've dis, uh, discussed again, which best basically demonstrated the non-inferiority of preoperative chemo with selective chemo radiation, which essentially only 10% of patients got. So this is how I treat, and I think this is the most important group of slides for, for this audience. And I don't want to say this is the standard of care, but this is how I've put together all the data um, to offer care to my rectal cancer patients. So I'll go stage by stage. For stage one patients, um, I, for upper rectal cancers, I offer them all um, radical resection with tumor-specific mesorectal excision. For mid to lower rectal cancers, local excision for good risk patients. Uh, 
long course chemo radiation and local excision for T2 and 0 tumors. I always discuss um, radical resection. I always offer it, but these are the alternatives. So a patient who has stage 2 or 3 rectal cancer that shows up to see me, I basically offer them a, a menu. And I, I kid you not, they get a piece of paper that has three options on it. And I discuss all three options. So option one, I call the mercury prospect approach. And I basically, I encourage this approach for tumors that are above nine to 10 centimeters. So basically for intraperitoneal upper rectal cancers. And again, very goal specific. My goal in these patients is I know I'm gonna offer them uh, radical resection. So my goal is in order to give them the best function I'm trying to minimize radiation. So if they fit criteria, meaning if they're not the ugly tumors that we've discussed, they will get upfront chemo um, with selective chemo radiation, and I'll, prob I'll usually avoid radiation altogether based on mercury protocol, and they'll get a low anterior resection. Advantages being that they avoid radiation. Disadvantages being that, you know, lower chance of uh, organ preservation, which was not our goal in the first place. Option two um, is what I call the OPRA approach, and it's really the OPRA slash GRACAR approach. So generally, I, I, I encourage this approach for tumors that are less than seven centimeters from the verge. And in this set of patients, my goal is organ preservation or sphincter preservation at the, at the, at the uh, least. So. Generally, what I will, uh, so the OPRA approach is TNT with upfront chemo radiation. Um, I'm trying to downsize the tumor as much as possible so they'll get the consolidation chemotherapy, not the induction chemotherapy. I restage and I always restage with biopsy. Why? Because you can identify, if you have a positive biopsy after, uh, a, you know, an appropriate time after chemo radiation, then that tumor is going to regrow. And I'll show you a few cases where that's the case. So I'll flex it with biopsy. Um, if they have a complete clinical response with a negative biopsy, I may offer them watch and wait, but I almost always locally excise unless it's not technically reasonable. For near complete responders, they'll always get uh, local excision. The advantage is organ preservation, obviously. The last uh, option in my menu is the Prodige 23, um, and our, uh, I call it the Prodige approach essentially. And these are kind of the high risk patients for systemic disease that they have a lot of nodes or there's unconfirmed but suspected metastatic disease. I will uh, highly encourage a, a, an induction chemotherapy approach because I'm trying to, the goal is to limit systemic recurrence. Um, so this is kind of this approach pictorially, pictorially. So uh, the treatment basically diverges at the peritoneal reflection. So tumors above 9 to 10 centimeters, basically intraperitoneal tumors, I'm trying to minimize radiation, and we're doing TMEs essentially, and trying to uh, preserve function. Tumors below 7 centimeters, um, where the sphincter is threatened or close, I'm trying to man maximize organ preservation. So in these patients, I will offer a TNT approach, um, uh, basically the kitchen sink approach with local excision or watch and wait. Tumors between seven and nine centimeters, I, ca I call that kind of a dealer's choice. So I, I, this is where patient decision making really comes to mind. And the reason I'm not necessarily comfortable, especially with anterior tumors, um, uh, doing organ preservation here is because it's much harder to do local excision here because you risk peritoneal entry. So future directions, in my opinion, at least, and we're talking about mid to low rectal cancers, everybody is a potential candidate for organ preservation. And what are the goals? Um, somewhat ambitious, but we need to improve restaging and surveillance strategies to identify potential regrowths earlier. And these include using biopsy more liberally, more liberal use of PET-CT scans and potentially for identifying nodal recurrences, more liberal use of circulating DNA. And I would say in my, in my opinion, more liberal use of advanced local excision techniques. So uh, in my opinion, the best 
options for organ preservation is to combine the OPRA and gray card data. You can potentially prevent the 95% local, you know, intraluminal recurrences with the local excision. And you can consider local excision for salvage for regrowths, which, again, was a crossover to the TME most of these trials. Um, so I'm going to present, and I promise it'll be brief, uh, four cases very quickly um, that uh, demonstrate some of the difficult decision making and some of the challenges with organ preservation. Um, and the reason I'm presenting these four patients, they all tracked, basically I was seeing them all at the same time. And they all had different outcomes with very similar cancers. Um, so uh, very briefly, um, so patient one uh, was a male in his 50s or 60s. He had clinical T3 N0 rectal cancer right at five centimeters, sitting on his, uh, basically on top of his sphincter. Um, so after I presented him the menu that I talked about with all three approaches, he was interested in organ preservation, so we went along the uh, Oprah, Oprah route, which is uh, long course chemo radiation with consolidation chemotherapy. He had among the best clinical responses I've seen, meaning I could not palpate the tumor anymore, I couldn't palpate a scar, PET CT negative, MRI negative, and I flex sig everybody, and on flex, flex sig he had a faint white scar. I biopsied that faint white scar, and the biopsy, to my shock, demonstrated adenocarcinoma, residual adenocarcinoma. So. This is kind of, uh, you know, I strayed away from OPRA, meaning I biopsied. Uh, but I, at this point, I have a bi positive biopsy. I told him, listen, you know, you're basically a regrowth that's waiting to happen. Standard of care is TME. You know, you have, you've had a great response. The other option is local excision with all the risks of uh, possible nodal recurrence and so on, which I estimate, like I said, around 5 to 7%. So what happened with him? Uh, he went for a second opinion. At, he went to two universities and he got a second opinion. And um, I didn't see him, but he was treated basically with watch and wait, uh, just based on protocol to some degree, I guess, uh, ignoring my biopsy results. Um, so re predictably, he had a regrowth, and I'm not sure what happened after that, but I saw him eight, eight months later. And he, bottom line, he had a three centimeter ulcerated fungating tumor. And it was a regrowth that on protocol should have been caught earlier, but it was not um, because he didn't, uh, I'm sure there was a patient issue as well. But bottom line is he ended up having uh, a TME. I tried to do an LAR, but it was sitting on the margin. My, my rectal margin was, my uh, uh, sphincter margin was positive, so I ended up getting an APR. What did the APR show? Uh, he had a T3 tumor now, but he had all negative nodes. So assuming, again, these are difficult decisions to make, these are difficult assumptions to make. Assuming he had said yes to local excision eight months or whatever, a year earlier, then he would have been cured with complete organ preservation. So he's cured now most likely, but he has a colostomy. So I had another patient tracking along the same, same time. She had a CT3N1 rectal cancer, again, right in the same location, uh, one centimeter off the sphincter, PET positive IMA node. They had called it an iliac node, but it was an IMA node. So again, uh, she, she got the OPRA protocol. Um, after she was done with the OPRA protocol, I flex sigged her with biopsy, and guess what? Uh, she, had, she had a palpable nodule, so she was not a complete clinical response. She was a near complete response. Uh, I flex sigged her, biopsied her. She had adenocarcinoma. I again discussed LAR versus local excision, but is, is somewhat from the oncolo oncologist sort of uh, push, this patient refused both, went on to get 12 cycles of chemotherapy total, and I flex sigged her and I biopsied it again, and guess what? She still had residual adenocarcinoma. So the patient, and this is where patient decision making and the goals of uh, treatment are important. We had a long discussion of what to do. The patient was kind of indifferent about organ preservation and she wanted me to make the decision essentially for her. And when somebody asked me to make the decision for her, I generally will end up doing the most aggressive approach. And we did an LAR with D3 lymphadenectomy, complete mesorectal excision and so on. And uh, hand-sewn low anterior resection, so very low tumor again. Um, organ pres uh, sphincter preservation, but you know, there are going to be some functional issues. Uh, 
Um, what did her path show? T1 and 0 disease, all nodes, including that PET positive IMA node, were now gone. So again, a difficult decision, but also a patient in a, you know, in an ideal world would have been a candidate for, or not just a candidate, she was a candidate for organ preservation. But in an ideal world, if she had gotten local excision, she would have been cured with organ preservation. So uh, an odd patient, um, one of my most challenging patients, had a CT3N1 uh, tumor at seven centimeters anteriorly, just above seven centimeters. Uh, we had a long discussion. I'm, I've basically had at least 10 appointments with this patient during uh, the course of his treatment. Uh, but I, we offered him the OPRA approach. Again, he chose option, we chose option one from the menu. Um, and then this patient did not complete the upfront uh, chemo radiation at all. So I think he stopped at four weeks or so. He refused the consolidation chemo. And I, again, flexed him with biopsy. He had a major response. He was a near complete responder, biopsy negative, PET CT negative, MRI negative. So, you know, he was completely off the reserve, off any protocol. So I told the guy basically, hey, you know, the, you, you, we haven't done any of the uh, protocol approaches. So I recommended low anterior resection, refused. He also refused local excision. Uh, and there's a reason he refused it. We talked about all the risks of peritoneal entry and so on. So we surveilled him. I surveil at three months, not at four months. Uh, so I surveil every three months. But lo and behold, at three months, his PET CT at his rectum came back positive. And I flex sigged him and I biopsied the heck out of that lesion, that scar. Um, and the flex sig didn't come back with cancer, but came back with high grade dysplasia. Again, uh, I offered him LAR, which was my, uh, which was the standard. He refused. And he almost refused local excision again, but because he was PET positive, because of all uh, high-grade dysplasia and so on, I was able to convince him to do a TAMIS or a local excision. And he underwent local excision. This is his operation uh, in, in a very, all the surgeons will appreciate this. This is, so here's his, how do I play this? Here's his, this is sped up, wow. Very sped up. So there's a scar. Hold on one second. What happened here? So there's his scar. And there's a little ulceration. Those ulcerations are from my biopsy. But so this guy was not a great responder. He didn't complete his therapy. But we ended up doing this operation, which is quick, I promise. It's, so you have to be able to do this operation well. And in this guy, I ended up excising 90% of his rectal circumference, as you'll see. So it's not just about doing a local excision. You have to do uh, an oncologically aggressive local excision in some of these patients. And this was an anterior tumor. And you'll see the problem with anterior tumors just because this patient did have uh, the issue that I was most concerned about. So. I'm anterior, or I'm uh, anterior, so I'm sorry, the tumor is anterior. I'm actually going posterior, and you'll see that 90% of the circumference will be gone. But as, as I'm taking sort of the last bit of uh, rectal wall, you'll see what uh, we were fearing in, in a second. Sorry, it'll, it'll happen in a second. So here it is. So you'll see that I'm actually sitting right on the peritoneal reflection right now. And bam, a hole in the peritoneum right there. So I'm in the abdomen now, which I, I, I don't like. So we remove the tumor. And you'll see the extent of excision right now. It's basically 90% of the circumference. So I'll freeze it here. But you see all the circumference. So it'll freeze. Basically, I left this small strip of thing, but the entire circumference is gone with this. So essentially, repaired the peritoneal hole. I promise I repaired it. I don't necessarily show it in this. It was very difficult because I was now insufflating the peritoneum. Um, so repaired it and then ended up closing him. And it's fast forwarded now, so 
It'll, it'll be ending in the next 30 seconds here, actually 18 seconds. So then we do a full thickness closure. It's sped up, so it's at around two to three times. I wish I could operate this fast. In any case, it'll show you the final result in the next five seconds. But uh, this is the uh, final result here. So completely closed. I kept him in the hospital for a few days to make sure that he didn't have any sub pelvic sepsis. He went home. This is his specimen. So it was a four by five centimeter specimen. So he has central ulceration there. The central ulceration is most likely from my biopsies. He had a residual 3.5 millimeter focus of um, adenocarcinoma uh, with negative margins, but in the muscularis propria. So technically, he's a T3 N0 uh, uh, um, resection. So he still qualifies for LAR. I'm sure he's going to refuse it, so he'll be surveilled. And the last, the last patient, uh, very straightforward. So she was a C2 T3 N1 disease, five to six centimeters from the anal verge. Again, after the menu presentation, she, we decided on the OPRA approach. She completed uh, the chemo radiation. She actually did not complete the uh, consolidation chemo. She had toxicity. She had a near complete response, but she had a polypoid mass there. So technically, based on uh, the consensus, uh, all the consensus, uh, 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 the consensus on uh, response, she was somebody who qualified for a TME. Um, but we, after discussion, she, we, we discussed whether we should biopsy her, TME her, or a locally excise her. And she definitely wanted organ preservation, so I skipped the biopsy, and we went to local excision, um, which, was, which was both diagnostic and therapeutic. But after local excision, she was a path complete responder. So that nodule that we felt was a tubular adenoma. In any case, she's getting surveilled. So, and we're very aggressive with surveillance, so uh, again, not I don't know how, how um, reasonable this is, but we surveil with circulating DNA, MRI, PET-CT, and FlexSig every three months. And that's it. So 